Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome back to the Albright. It's my distinct pleasure to introduce Ian Jones, who is the Education and Cultural Affairs Junior Research Fellow this semester here at the Albright. Uh, Ian's educational background uh, is uh, quite distinguished. He has a BA in Anthropology and English from the University of Massachusetts uh, at Amherst. Uh, and then he came back to the West Coast to work on his uh, MA in Anthropological Archaeology at UC San Diego. Uh, and I think he's probably very happy. And I'm happy to announce that he's submitted his final draft of his dissertation uh, for his PhD, also in Anthropological Archaeology. <laughs> That's right, put it together for almost Dr. Jones. Um, so also at the University of California in San Diego. Um, so in the fine tradition of the Raiders of the Lost Ark, soon we can call him Dr. Jones. <laughs> so uh, Ian comes to us with a rich background uh, in field work, many seasons uh, in Jordan and also here uh, in Israel, uh, primarily focused around the Wadi Fedan project. Um, he's also held fellowships uh, at ACOR here at the Albright, uh, has had some distinguished grants uh, from the NSF uh, and UC San Diego uh, as well. Uh, although he, he's just finished his dis dissertation, or almost just, he, <laughs> almost, don't want to jinx you. Um, he has numerous publications. They're focused primarily around the themes of copper production uh, in the Islamic period in Jordan, and also digital archaeology. But his topics also veer into looking at rural communities and labor in the Middle Islamic period in the Southern Levant, which I believe led him to his talk today entitled Sugar Production and the Political Economy of the Southern Levant During the Ayyubid Period. Please welcome almost Dr. Jones. <laughs> Oh good, this is on. And perfect. Thank you, Aaron, for the introduction. And thank all of you for being here this afternoon, I guess, to listen to my talk. I'd also like to thank the Albrights for letting me give this talk and for giving me the money to do this research in the first place, all of the Albright staff for making my stay here so comfortable, and all of the other Albright fellows for making this stay so enjoyable and intellectually stimulating, and the director of the Albright Institute for running the computer right now, which is also a really important task, actually. So thank you, Matt. Anyway, <coughs> yeah, I do want to talk to you tonight about a project I've been working on here at the Albright on, as you can tell from the title, sugar production in the Southern Levant in the Ayyubid period. And this is still at a pretty preliminary stage as far as everything goes, so I welcome any comments or questions you might have at the end that might push me in useful directions moving further on. Um, and the way I want to organize this talk is by giving you a lot of background about the history of sugar production and the sugar production process, which, although its background is kind of the interesting part and will prevent me from spending a lot of time talking about the ratios of one kind of sugar pot to the other one, which is something I'm really interested in, but you're probably not. Okay. Uh, and then I'll briefly talk about the really broad aspects of the project and then move into one very narrow aspect of the project and end with that. So first, now this went too far. Oh, nice, gotcha. Uh, first, before I get into anything else, I want to talk very briefly about chronological terms because these vary region to region and also the chronology varies region to region. This is a diagram I put together a couple of years ago comparing the dynastic chronologies of coastal Israel to southern Jordan. And you can see that what I'll be talking about is that really narrow band in the middle of the diagram, the Ayyubid period, which lasts from about 1187 until 1263 AD. Those are really nice round dates, I think. Um, 
And if I veer into Don Whitcomb's archaeological chronology for southern Jordan, I apologize. I know there are people who are probably not comfortable with the Crusader period being called Middle Islamic, but what can I do? That's what we call it. So <laughs> anyway, if I s feel free to get mad at me or whatever, it's fine. Um, the reason I want to start off with a lot of background is because every time I've talked about sugar production in the past, and it's come up in a couple of my talks, the first question I'm asked is always, so what were they making sugar out of in the southern Levant? And I'm always kind of surprised by this, not because people don't know, I probably wouldn't know if I wasn't working on this, but because it's always the first question every time I present anything on sugar production. And so I figure maybe I should actually start responding to these comments I'm getting and just including all of this in the talk rather than having you have to ask at the end and wondering the whole time. So let's start with that. <laughs> sugar production, I'll try not to go too long on this. Sugar itself, sugar cane, was probably domesticated in Papua New Guinea, or more accurately, two different wild types of cane were probably hybridized in Papua New Guinea to create the domesticated sugar cane that we know and love. And this made it to Indonesia and mainland South Asia at some point in the second or first centuries BC, we don't really know. The process of making crystalline sugar, which is the process I'll be talking about today, was developed probably in India at some point after the first century AD. Again, we don't really know. At some point after that, it makes its way into Iran. Uh, that's during the Sasanian period, but when specifically, we don't really know. So that's between the third and seventh centuries AD. From there, it moves into Iraq after the Islamic conquest, and it moves westward out of Iraq after that. So we have evidence from papyri in Vienna that it had made it to Egypt by about the mid-8th century. Um, probably the scale of production in the mid-8th century is pretty low. We don't really know, but that's some of the earliest evidence we have for it outside of Iraq. We know it had made it to Palestine by the end of the 10th century because Makadasi tells us that it's a product of Palestine that is rare elsewhere. But the only city he says it's a main product of is Tyre. So it's being grown elsewhere, but if it's a major product of anything, it's on the coast. And we can date the expansion of the industry, at least in the Jordan Valley, by bookending two different geographers. So al writing in the middle of the 12th century, tells us that the main product of the Jordan Valley is indigo. Yakut, writing in 1225, or around 1225, we'll say, tells us that the main product of the Jordan Valley is sugar. So at some point between the middle of the 12th century and 1225, everyone stops growing indigo and starts growing sugar. And the specifics of that are one of the questions I'm trying to answer in this project. And like I said, it's at a preliminary stage, so I don't have a really good answer for you about exact dates or anything for that yet, but I'll talk a little bit about it. Production picks up from there in the 13th and early 14th centuries. The heyday of sugar production is the early Mamluk period, essentially. By the end of the 14th century, sugar production is in decline in this region, and by the 16th century, it's more or less done, with a few exceptions. There are a couple of sites where there's evidence for sugar production in the very early Ottoman period, but they aren't that many. And the general rule seems to be that by that time, nobody wanted to produce sugar if no one was making them do it, and they would rather have grown indigo or sesame or cotton or any number of things, all of which they did grow instead. So that is the basic story of sugar production in this region. Now I want to talk about the production process a little bit, again, because I think this is interesting and hopefully you'll find it interesting too, and because it's useful to know what we're looking for as far as archaeological correlates. What are the processes that are associated with the remains that we find? So, in order to make sugar, you first have to grow sugar. And once you've grown it to the point where you can cut it, you cut it down and you have not that long to get it from this stage to the sugar factory. It actually starts going bad in the course of something like a couple of hours. 
And so this is actually one way we can tell what are dubious sugar factories and what are real sugar factories. Is if it's too far away from any place you could have grown sugar to actually get the sugar cane there in the amount of time that would have or any amount of time you would have needed to in order to make sugar, it's probably not a real sugar factory. It has to be at least that close. And so there are a couple that have been recorded as sugar factories that we know are not precisely for this reason. Once you have it cut, you take it to the factory itself and it goes through a multi-stage processing. And I'm going to demonstrate what all of these stages were using the sugar factory at Kuklius Thavros in Cyprus. Mostly because this is the essential example of what a sugar factory should look like. It's a Levantine plan. It's one of the few that's been excavated where all of the rooms have actually been intact. And it seems to match more or less the process as we have it recorded in historical documents. So essentially every work that's ever been written on sugar production has summarized the process as recorded by Nuori, who talks about sugar in 14th century Egypt. And so that's basically the process I'm going to summarize for you now, because it's more or less how everyone understands how this worked. So the first thing is water is brought, at least in this factory, via this channel here. And this is, or was, a uh, water press, essentially, or a water mill. The millstone is gone now, but at Kuklua, this is the earliest millstone that they had. And because it's up on the plan, and you'll probably ask me about it if I don't mention it, yes, there are two other millstones. There's this one, which is a later animal-driven mill. This is a later stage of the factory, and they're not in use at the same time. And then there's this millstone down in the corner. And in 1991, when they published the first excavations at Kuklius Thavros, their interpretation was that this millstone seemed to indicate some kind of multi-stage production process, where it was first crushed on the water mill and then crushed on this stone, but they didn't really understand how the process worked or how the stone worked. The most recent publication was in 2015, and they had revised this to say that they don't understand how the stone worked or what it did, but they know it's in the earlier stage of the factory and it must have done something. <laughs> um, so let's just never speak of it again. <laughs> so anyway. In one phase of use, water comes in and turns this pressing stone that then crushes the sugar. From there, the sugar is taken into this boiling room, which I'll get to in a second. But really quickly, here's what this looks like on the ground. So this is the sugar factory in Khorasafi in southern Jordan. Dino Politis has been excavating this since 2002. Um, and this is also a really well-preserved sugar factory, and it's also really nice because they've finished excavating and have now presented it for tourists, like me, to go and take photos of it to show to people like you. So, you can see the same things basically represented here. This is the water channel, where the water comes into the factory, and so it's actually outside of the factory. It comes in through these channels, into an underground room, not pictured, where it turns a water wheel on top of these grinding stones. And you'll notice that at this particular site, there are two of these grinding stones, which will be important in a second. Um, I actually would have, up until a couple years ago, said three, but it turns out what they thought was the third one is actually an Ottoman flour mill and completely unrelated, so two. From there, the sugar goes through a number of boils. The first one probably in a very large vessel, like you see pictured here. We have descriptions of this uh, from the late 15th century traveler, Arnold von Harf for Egypt. And he describes boiling in a vessel that held what he describes as nine to 10 buckets, uh, which is not a really useful unit of measurements. Um, it is something like 100 to 800 liters, roughly. So it could be kind of big or it could be incredibly big, but <laughs> it's really hard to say. This one is incredibly big. At this stage, you theoretically can end the process and move on to the drying out, but you get a really low quality of sugar. And so at most of the mills, it goes through a number of boils after this in vessels that look more like this. Um, Nuweri tells us that in Arabic, these are called the suits or kudur, the singular is dust and kidr. Um, there's no scale on this, I apologize, it's not my image, but that's about a meter across, weighs something like 150 to 250 kilograms, 
someone recently questioned that figure, but I emailed Dean of Policies, and he says that as far as he knows, it's still, the rest of it's about 150 kilograms, so I'm going with that because Dino knows better than I do. He's the one who put it in the museum, so I assume he has picked it up at some point. Um, these are actually what got me interested in sugar production to begin with. My dissertation is actually on copper production during this period in southern Jordan. And one of the things I propose is that the copper industry in southern Jordan is revived at roughly the time the sugar industry is expanding in the Jordan Valley precisely to make these things because they're pretty big and you need a lot of them. So to return to this image from Kuklia, Mulroy tells us that you need eight of these per millstone at a factory. And it's not totally clear whether he's talking about eight of the copper vessels or eight of these hearths on which they sit. And you can see in the second one down that each hearth actually holds two of these. That's, again, about a meter across. So 16 total in Kuklia. And if you need two of those for the millstone, that's like 32 at Tawahina, Sukkur, and Gorsafi. So when you see the map of how many of these sugar factories there are, that's a lot of these copper vessels. But that's not today's talk. I could go on about this for the next hour or so and really bore you and not actually tell you what I'm working on. So <laughs> I'll, I'll stop here. Um, you boil it. After you boil it, you put it into these. And this is your basic Middle Islamic period sugar pot in two parts. The top part, Nuevo tells us, is called an abruge. And you can see it has this hole in the bottom that molasses would have dripped out of into this thing at the bottom that he tells us is called a caboose, which basically just means a jar. Uh, so once you get through this process, you end up with a cone of sugar in the top, the abruge, and a jar full of molasses. <laughs> and then you can put this through further refining stages to get increasingly well, increasingly refined sugar. I would have said butter, which is what medieval sources would say, but actually the modern interpretation of sugar is kind of the opposite now, right? So the white sugar is the like stuff you get in the packets at McDonald's or whatever. And if a place has, you know, like the brown turbinado sugar, that's really nice. But uh, no, the medieval opinion was exactly the opposite. The lighter the sugar you could get, the better. The really nice stuff had been just thoroughly refined. Um, and so you can continue doing that and putting it in increasingly small jars until you finally get sugar that's really expensive and really white. What I'm actually interested in in this project is the political economy of sugar in the Ayyubid period. And I sort of love this crazy 1930s image because it kind of gives you an idea of what I'm interested in. So sugar is produced on all of these islands with these histories of colonial slave sugar production. It's transported via boat to Pennsylvania where it's refined further and then sent out via the American rail system to your front door. Um, and that's, that's kind of what I'm interested in in terms of medieval sugar production, except that nobody was sending sugar to Pennsylvania in the 13th century. Mm -hmm. Probably. I actually, I don't know that for sure. You can ask me in the questions. So. Three major questions. First, why does the sugar industry expand when and where it does? I've described this previously as sort of the spatial and chronological dynamics of the sugar industry or the expansion of the sugar industry. What are the political effects of that expansion? And how does sugar relate to other industries, and for me specifically the copper industry? And these are the questions that I want to answer. Um, and because when they give you advice or advice on how to write, they tell you to kill your darlings, I'm just going to ignore this last question that I'm really interested in and tell you about the first two, which are sort of more relevant to the project. And you can maybe ask me about the, the last one. <laughs> so what I'm primarily interested in is how sugar relates to the Ayyubid dynasty. And everyone at the Albright should also be interested in the Ayyubid dynasty because the Albright happens to be on Salahuddin Street, and Salahuddin is, of course, the founder of the Ayyubid dynasty. Um, and this is an excellent image of him uh, at the Battle of Hatim. 
A funny quick story about this. At one point, I said I was going to include this slide in every talk I ever gave after I did it, and I have not been super great about that, but I figured I'd bring it back for this one because mm -hmm. it's relevant. So, brief overview of why I find the Ayyubids interesting. Um, the Ayyubid dynasty, archaeologists sometimes refer to this as like an empire or a state, and that really doesn't do justice to how interesting the political dynamics of the early 13th century are. The Ayyubids are a strange bicentral polity, so the seat of dynastic power moves between Cairo and Damascus depending on whether the head of the dynasty happens to be the Sultan of Cairo or Damascus. But at various times throughout the period of Ayyubid rule, emirates or principalities became semi-autonomous or entirely autonomous from those centers and just didn't report to either of those people, basically. And one of those autonomous emirates was based in Karak in central Jordan and controlled most of what is modern Jordan, or at least the non-desert parts of modern Jordan. And for a lot of the 13th century, Karak is autonomous from Cairo and Damascus. And one of the things I've proposed in my dissertation, I'll summarize the thousand pages so you don't have to read it, is that a lot of this has to do with sugar production. Basically, sugar production in the Jordan Valley expands right as Karak is becoming autonomous, and the economic autonomy that that cash crop, the sort of international commodity, gave them allowed them a degree of political autonomy from Cairo and Damascus. It allowed them to say to the sultans of Cairo or Damascus when they came knocking and demanding that they give things up, that they didn't really owe them anything. And we actually have historical records of that exact thing happening and that exact thing working. That the Sultan of Cairo would show up and demand something, and the Sultan of or the Amir of Karak would just say, "Get lost," and they'd get lost. And that's it. So it seems that it was sugar production, at least partially, that gave them that autonomy, and it was also sugar production that made them a target of the Mamluks when the Mamluks took over in the middle of the 13th century. So in other regions, Hama and other places in Syria, Ayyubid Amirs were actually allowed to become governors of those places after they had been conquered by the Mamluks. It did not happen in Karak. In Karak, the Amir was tricked into coming to a meeting and was assassinated on the road. And after that point, the Mamluks actually went through a series of administrative reforms that seemed to have been geared basically toward preventing people from ever gaining that kind of autonomy from the Sultan ever again. So it was a, a double-edged sword in a sense. It gave them a certain amount of autonomy from a weak state, but when a strong state came in, they weren't able to maintain that autonomy through those means. So that is more or less the background to the project and what I'm interested in looking at. The project itself basically has several different aspects, I guess. So the main aspect is going through and establishing a database of every published sugar production site in the Southern Levant, which is actually more exciting than it sounds. <laughs> um, and you might be asking yourself, if you're familiar at all with sugar production, why would you do this? Hasn't someone done it before? Yes, I've anticipated that question, and I put together this slide to address it. Um, the last really intensive overview of sugar production was Edna Stern's master's thesis, which was written in 1999. And so first off, it's in Hebrew, which I don't read, and that's not necessarily a point against it, but it means that it's not accessible for scholars who don't speak Hebrew, of which there are a lot in archaeology, for better or worse. The other thing about her master's thesis is that it's now almost 20 years old. And a lot has happened in the archaeology of sugar production in the last 20 years. So while she's compiled a lot of data, there's a lot more that could be compiled. Beyond that, the next most recent really intensive overview was Brigitte Poiré's chapter in 1995 in French, which I guess is slightly more accessible, but is also less um, selective, 
if you will. So that chapter is essentially a list of every mill in the southern Levant that could possibly have had sugar produced at it, whether or not there's any actual evidence for that. And so we know that a lot of the stuff that Brigitte Perret has in that chapter um, is not sugar production. So what I mentioned at the beginning of the talk about knowing that you only have a certain amount of distance you can travel with sugarcane before it goes bad and you just have to start over again, there are a lot of mills in that chapter that don't meet that criterion and that's not really addressed in her commentary. So while it's a really good and really comprehensive chapter, it has that weakness and also it's over 20 years old now. And then after that, there was a study of excavated sugar production sites published by Catherine Strange Burke in Munnook Studies Review in 2004, which is really good with two or three errors that are actually quite minor that I'll talk about in a second because they happen to be about a site that I'll be talking about in this talk. Um, but the thing about that is, again, 2004 is now almost 15 years ago, and she talks about five excavated sugar production sites. Using the same criteria that she used, we can now talk about over 15. So a lot has happened in the last 15 to 20 years that actually makes this worth doing again. And I should mention, because there are probably people in the audience who know this, yes, um, Anat Perand also in 1999 published a very good chapter on Crusader sugar production. Edna Stern et al. published a chapter two years ago in an edited volume, edited by Dino Politis actually, on Crusader sugar production in the Aco Plain. And those are all really good chapters. But I'm, as I said, more interested in the places that were under Ayyubid control during this period. And so I'll just to really quickly show you what those are. You can see these clusters of sites on this map. So there's one down here in the southern Ahuar, or actually all of the Ahuar, along the Dead Sea. There's another here in the Jordan Valley, and actually I haven't even circled the whole thing. There are these outliers to the north and south. There's this Crusader cluster over here to the west. And then there's this really weird guy who's all alone up here. And I'm going to talk about him in just a second. But just to give you a quick, I guess, explanation of the map. Also, you'll see there are these different categories on here, sugar production, possible sugar production, distribution related, and then not related. Um, this collapses a lot of complexity in the database that I'm trying to compile because I both don't really know how to represent it visually, and I don't really know how to talk about it coherently at this stage of research. So the database is really going through and trying to critically evaluate the published information to determine what the earliest states of sugar production are and the latest states of sugar production are, and whether or not sugar production actually took place at the site, and if not, what the hell are sugar vessels doing at this site, and so on. Um, and yeah, you kind of wind up with something like that, because I could show you a map with like 40 colors on it, and it wouldn't mean anything anyway, so this is what we have here. So if you want to ask about the database or any of these specific dots or whatever at the end, feel free. I suspect that that's already more boring than anyone cares about. So instead, for the rest of the talk, and hopefully this will be relatively brief, I don't want to give you a really in-depth summary of the site, I want to talk about that weird guy who's all alone up there in the north the site of Yasud Hama'ala. So this site was excavated a while back. Um, it was excavated in 1974 by Avraham Biran and Dan Ehrman, and then again in 1982 and 1983 by Yair Shaham, uh, who also went back in 1985 and actually did a survey of a couple of the surrounding sites as well. Um, and so I have to thank them posthumously, and particularly Yair Shaham, as uh, Rachel Bendov, who isn't here, pointed out to me when she met me a few days ago, uh, Yair Shaham really did a lot of work on this site early on, sort of organizing all of the material quite well and determining what was restorable. And uh, actually, the publication, although incomplete, is really good. So I owe him a lot of thanks. And also, I have to thank David Elon at Hebrew Union College for letting me go back and look at this material, too. To give you some idea of what they actually found, there's a synagogue at the site that seems to be the earliest 
level. The identification of this is a little weird, and it seems to be based primarily on stones that you can sort of see in reuse in the sugar factory, and then an inscription that was found at another site to the south that indicates that there was a synagogue here. But most of what they found was this sugar factory, and you can see the plan of the excavations here. The architecture is not very complete. And so I'm going to show you this in comparison to the Kukuostavros factory to hopefully come up with at least some idea of what we're actually looking at. I think what we're looking at is this. So these are water channels, and it seems to end plastered installations that are also a bit weird, these small pools. It seems to be this area of the sugar factory outside of the factory itself, where the water is entering and we're not quite to the millstones yet. It could theoretically be other water channels in the factory. There are others, but I think this is the most likely. And you'll also note, although you can't see most of them very well, there are three of these channels, which might indicate that there are multiple millstones as well. They found exactly zero of the millstones, so this is all a little bit speculative, but it could be that it's a pretty big factory. Not quite sure. What's interesting about this site is, first off, that it seems to be the only sugar production site that's been identified in the Hula Valley. And also, the politics of this region in the 13th century are a bit weird. You can see that it's pretty close to Banyas and Galata Suboda, the Ayubid um, castle up in the northern, as it's really in the Golan, not even the Hula Valley. Uh, it's also close to Tibnin, and it's very close to Safed. And so at different points in the 13th century, it would have been under the control of those different places, to give you the brief overview. Uh, the Crusaders controlled basically all of this region up to the Battle of Hattin, after which they lost it to the Ayyubids. The Ayyubids had Iqta'at at both Banyas and at Safed, but dismantled those fortifications in like 1220 ish, somewhere around there. Then they built Galata Subeba. The Crusaders got Tibnin and Safed back in 1240, but did not get Banyas, which remains an Ayyubid Ikta. And part of why all of that is interesting is you get this dynamic you don't really get in a lot of other places, where it goes from Crusader to Ayyubid, back to Crusader, but the Ayyubids maintain a presence really, really close to the site. And so there's a lot going on. So let's go to the next slide so you can see what they published, and then all of this will make more sense. These are the two published pottery plates from the site. They only published these two, and as you can see, the vast majority of what they published were the sugar pots. Then there are these three pots that are all basically 13th century crusader. In addition to this, they also published a 13th century crusader coin, probably minted in Cyprus. My question coming into this material, and one of the reasons I wanted to look at this material, was whether or not we can recognize an Ayyubid phase before this basically post-1240 Crusader material. And it doesn't sound like a lot of time. We're dealing with the period 1187 to 1240, but that's actually not all that much more difficult than recognizing an Ayyubid phase anywhere else. Keep in mind that the longest Ayyubid phase you could possibly have lasts from 1187 until 1263. That's not very long either, right? So it, it's a 20-year difference. It should theoretically be recognizable if it's there. And I'll get to that in a second. The second reason I wanted to look at this material is to look specifically at these sugar pots. And I'm just going to briefly mention this because it's really boring if this is not what you want to work on. Um, Eva Kaptin proposed, following a couple of other publications, that you should be able to look at the ratios of the top parts to the bottom parts and determine whether or not you're looking at a sugar factory or some other kind of sites involved in sugar production. And theoretically, at sugar factories, you should see a lot more of the top ones than you do of the bottoms, for two reasons. First, at the sugar factories, most of the cones, the abelige, will be broken to remove the actual cone of sugar. And the second reason 
is that a lot of those bottoms leave and go other places. So at Tanspan, for example, they have a Mamluk storeroom that has a bunch of sugar pots and they're all the molasses jars. There are none of the uppers. It doesn't work out everywhere. At Karak, they have both, and you can't produce sugar at Karak. That's just the distribution center. There are probably other distribution centers, but the ratio should be different. And so that's one thing I'm trying to do is quantify what they found at Yasut HaMa'ala, because that's not published in the reports, and it's not, as far as I can tell, recorded in their notes. That's also really, really boring to talk about. Um, anyway, the, the conclusion is, yeah, there are a lot, lot more of those upper parts at Yasut HaMa'ala than the bottoms, which is exactly what you would expect, because it's almost certainly a sugar production site. But the more quantified data we have, the better we'll be able to tell what those ratios should actually look like and over different periods. Anyway, back to the question of the Ayyubids. The short answer is no. Um, there doesn't seem to be anything at the site that necessarily has to predate 1240. And the earliest material even has sort of pretty clear crusader connections. So you get these three-handed pots that Edna Stern thinks are produced in Accra. They probably are. Um, and a bunch of other pottery that looks very crusader, and nothing that looks Ayyubid pretty much at all, unfortunately. Uh, you do, however, see continuity into the Mamluk period, and that's one point where Burke was wrong, actually. She said that it's a 13th century site. In fact, it's 13th to 14th. They published it this way, and there's 14th century material there. The last point, and then I will stop talking, I promise, is Burke also says that the excavator said there was no earlier or later material found at the site, and that is not true. The excavators are actually very careful to say that there's no earlier material found at the site, which is the case. There's no earlier material. There's a lot of later material. Uh, in fact, there is a lot of Rishon al hardware. And this is a type of pottery, if you're not familiar with this, it's made uh, mostly in the late Ottoman period in the village of Rishon al fuhar about 12 kilometers north-northwest of Banyas. There's a ton of this, and the excavators were well aware of it. There are tags that are actually from these upper levels where they're surprised that there's no Rishon al fuhar in Losai. And the one thing with this that I really want to look at moving forward is whether there are early forms of this here as well. At a bunch of sites up north in the last, say, 10 or 15 years, um, and at Galata Subeba in particular, they've identified Rishal Fukhara in contexts that are relatively early, and it actually seems to emerge already in the late Mamluk period. And one reason that might be interesting is that at Yasut Hama'ala, you see a lot of Rishaya levels that also have a lot of sugar pottery in them. And one of the questions remaining is whether sugar production actually continued after the 14th century at this site into the latest stages of the industry, perhaps even past it, uh, as you see in other sites in the Galilee. So uh, I don't know yet, but there's a lot of this. Mm -hmm. And it's a question that I will try to answer in the coming weeks. So luckily, We've hit the conclusion slide. And uh, I just have one major conclusion that I want to point out, which is that the lack of Ayyubid phase at Yusut Hama'ala actually does tell us about differences in Ayyubid elite strategies. In particular, it tells us that in places where we don't see the emergence of these sort of autonomous itza'at, we also don't really see a lot of sugar production. In fact, in the region of Safed and Banyas, we don't see any in the Ayyubid period, which is markedly different from the areas of the Jordan Valley under Ayyubid control, where you see more sugar production sites than you can count. Uh, beyond that, obviously, this is still a work in progress, so I welcome any comments or questions you have at this point. And uh, yeah, that's all. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>
shoot the Mamluk period that was going on along the road and assassinated. Ah, uh, yeah. Um, Ruth Omar was his name. What? No, I want to do a comment. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was just making a connection. That was like um, the way the Vikings got England was they invited the king over to a dinner party and then massacred a bunch of people and then asked him if he wanted to be killed. That actually is a really good connection. <laughs> it's a very, like, I hadn't thought of that before, but yeah, it's a really similar set of circumstances. <laughs> um, did you ever find any of the molasses in the pots? Wow, that's a really good question. <laughs> um, I don't know. I, I assume that's something that you can actually use residue analysis to test for, and I assume someone is doing it. I guess the one downside maybe of doing that is that it would tell you that there's molasses in the pot, which you probably already know. Uh, but you do find a lot of them with concretions of that waste from sugar production on them. Actually, a lot of these are really, really disgusting to handle right out of the bag, because they have like just more junk stuck to them than they do pot shirt left. <laughs> so kind of, but yeah, not molasses specifically, unfortunately. Can you tell me which way the sugar was moving from the southern sites from Gora Safi, for instance? Yeah, that's a good question too. Um, my assumption is that a lot of this was moving northward to Damascus, probably. Uh, and even then westward to Europe. And so I think one of the questions that I still have remaining, and I don't really know the answer to this, and it's sort of problematic that I don't know the answer to this, is how exactly the emirs of Karak would be able to maintain this autonomy if they also rely on cities outside of their control to trade into. Um, and one of the answers might just be that the traders in some places are not totally affiliated with the, uh, the rulers of those cities, which we know happens. Um, and it, you know, it's also the case that at various points the Crusaders are friendlier or they are not. The Italians are always pretty friendly as long as the Pope is not on their case. So, um, but yeah, I think that's, that's pretty much the direction we're probably talking about is northward and westward and even Say what? I don't think during the Ayyubid period it's moving to Cairo. And part of it is that actually during the Ayyubid period in the southern Levant in general, you just don't see a lot of Egyptian material, actually. It's mostly uh, Syrian. And so it seems like that's not the major connection to the Mamluk period. Hi, and thanks very much. That was interesting. I have a question now about your final conclusion about Yusud Hamala. Because in your very helpful opening slides, you showed that sugar production needs to be organized and you need a lot of grunt labor. Right. So your conclusion that the lack of an Ayubid level there shows class or elite, a different strategy, elite strategies, leads me to the question, who was keeping people working <coughs> in Yasud Hama'ala. Who was in charge there and why do you, do you have some kind of small fieflet? Ah, uh, so you mean in the Crusader period? In the, peri in the period when it's being, yeah. Yeah, so then in the Mamluk period, I think the answer is basically that a lot of the Iqta'at, where sugar was produced, were actually under the direct control of the Sultan in Cairo, and you have sort of your the administrative apparatus of the Mamluk state. Um, in the Crusader period, although Safa is actually closer, uh, Yusuf Hamal, I think, would theoretically have been under the control of Tibnin. And so presumably it's being administered as part of this, like, Lebanese fiefdom, essentially, yeah, lordship of the Crusaders, but... What uh, makes you say that? What makes you say it's Tibnin as opposed to, for example, Banyas or Tuff? Well, so if it were Banyas, in that period, I would expect not to see a lot of connections to Cyprus or Accra or places like that. You would expect to see 
warm Syrian looking material, and more stuff that looks like what you get in the Ayyubid phases at Banyas. And I would say at Sebeba, but I don't think they had an Ayyubid phase at Sebeba that they excavated. Um, the reason I say it's Tibun and not Safed is uh, that that is what the people who work on the Crusader period say. And that's not what I work on, so I trust them. But yeah, I don't, I don't actually know how they're drawing these maps of principalities. There are a lot of like really weird crusader legal sources that talk very specifically about what is in one lordship or not another. And it seems like Lake Huma is mentioned. So, huh. Like it's fascinating because <laughs> in the Wadi Sabah, which is what they're Mostly when it's controlled by some larger entity, <laughs> that is. Ah, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the answer there is that the Crusaders kind of broke stuff up in the smaller parcels, where really. there were just a lot of people who were To the west. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting that it's not the north or south, but it's sort of moving from that direction. It is strange. Yeah. Um, there was also some research in the way the production was organized. You say uh, there's uh, control, but how it was controlled? Because sugar production needs a lot of investments, and it needs contacts to sell it overseas or to Damascus. How that was organized? Uh. <laughs> Yeah, that's like uh, <laughs> no, it's a really good question. I mean, it's sort of something I've been thinking about a lot. I guess the answer to part of that is that the production itself, at least in terms of the growing and everything, is organized sort of the way a lot of the other ikta'at are organized. So villages themselves are responsible for this sugar production is basically a tax burden, essentially. But in places that could grow sugar, the controllers of those, I really want to say this without using European terminology, and so I'm just not going to use it. The controllers of those ikta'at would have had a lot more say and would have been able to pressure those villages into growing sugar more specifically, whereas other villages would have had a little bit more autonomy in what they grew. Um, but yeah, as far as the specific organization, that's yeah, definitely something I need to look into more. And as I was saying to Elliot, the organization of the trade is a question I've had for a while now, and I've just not quite gotten into yet. And that's really, that's I think the next major critical step, because it's really important. Right. And so that, I think, it, we're talking specifically investment from the emirs themselves with the intention of actually building a bigger industry here. Yeah, because no Jordanian villager is wanting to grow sugar. And I think that's pretty clear from the fact that as soon as the Mamluks stop making them do it, they all stop doing it. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, there's clearly external investment that's coming in and building the infrastructure and telling them you have to do this instead of growing sesame or indigo or whatever it is you actually want to grow or your you know summer summer crops. I, yeah, that's uh, that's an interesting question too. That's sort of still a debate. Um, Tsugitaka Sato a couple years ago in his book on sugar production argued that he didn't think in the memory period, at least, there was agricultural slavery, that the Zanj rebellion just sort of made people too wary about this, and they only used slaves in households and for like that sort of thing. I don't know that a lot of people agree with him about that, and I think that's still something where the, there aren't a lot of sources that really talk about it, particularly for the Ayyubid period, what kind of labor is involved. That's a, an open question and a, an important one, yeah, because it's not fun to do this. Yeah, <laughs> right. production, you need yeah. really millions of 
Yeah, because you're breaking them after every use. So it's really a large buffering injection that's not being paid for liability. I would hope not. Yeah. Right, right. It's like amp it's like wine outputs, you know. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, I agree I think I remember there is a complete jar, sugar jar in Rockefeller, <coughs> in the big hole, in the second <laughs> hole. <coughs> so you can still see a complete jar there in the display. Is that also from the Sudamala? No, it's uh, not from the Sudamala. They don't say where is this form. And it oh, wait, do you mean the, the copper ones? No, it's, oh, it's uh, one of the, okay, yeah. Yes. In the, you know, Rockefeller has two big holes. Yeah. So in the second one, in the right one, at the end. And uh, it, it's a big one. It's nice to see. Interesting. Yeah, I'll have to go check that out. Well, if you go, work. give him a card for me. I will. Absolutely. <laughs> okay, last question. Oh. I sort of have a, a twofer, but um, <laughs> I'll try. I'll try to keep it them both brief. Last two questions. Um, I'm really curious about your uh, Karak Emirate. Ah, yes. Because, uh, do you mind going back to the um, map? It, because it sort of seems, yeah, back, back, back. Um, like it would be fairly isolated. I mean, it's, Karak is perfectly positioned to control the production around the southern Dead Sea, but everything else is pretty far away. So, I mean, was it that <coughs> localized? I mean, when you say the emirate, like the end, it <coughs> so a degree of autonomy because of the sugar, is it really kind of limited to uh, what I would call Moab? No. Okay. And so I think part of the autonomy probably comes from the fact that Karak is basically unstormable if you're not willing to sit there for a very long time. Like, I wish I had a picture of it, but it's not. Yeah. It, yeah, it's a pretty fortified place. But at, at its height, the Emirate of Karak actually controlled most of all of this. So generally, though not always included in the Emirate, was also Shobek. And generally, it also came with a lot of these Jordan Valley Iqta'at included as well. Um, and part of the administrative reforms of the Mamluk period Basically, they made these iqta'ats entirely temporary <laughs> and entirely revocable by the sultan. In the Ayyubid period, they're not. And so um, they kind of were a state in a certain sense. Like they were to a degree inheritable, and that, that was to a degree that they were not in the Mamluk period. They were absolutely not. Um, and there was also, I mean, there were cases of the Sultan, you know, saying, like, I would like you to forfeit your Iqta'at to another Ayyubid prince. And he says, if I give you that, where would I live? And they go, oh, yeah, good point. You're right. You have to keep it. <laughs> so. And, and my other question actually has to do with consumption. Ah. So you, you just very nicely pointed out that the locals who are growing the sugar cane probably were not actually, sounds like weren't consuming it, or at least not to the degree where generations later, the scale they were producing right, it. generations later, they actually just gave up right, growing it. So then if this is being controlled, you know, sort of further up the ladder, which seems natural, um, you know, where, sort of where is the consumption stopping? Is it, I mean, were the, were the sultanates consuming most of the sugar, or was it being mostly exported? I think it's been mostly exported, actually. And, too. and so it's kind of similar to Elliot's question. Um, in the Ayyubid period, I think that's still a question I'd like to answer, but we have later documentation of Italian sources that talk about the sugar of Cranco di Montreal, which is Carac and Montreal, Chobac, being the best sugar. And so it's making it at least to southern Europe and probably further on. Um, how far is a question, and I think that would be difficult to trace, because at some points, probably people are aware of what kind of sugar it is, but I think at some point it probably does kind of become a commodity, especially if it's the lower quality sugar, and so it might not always be possible to trace exactly where it's going. But yeah, I think it's being produced at a scale where we're not just talking local consumption, and we're not just talking consumption within, 
those sultanates, but this is really being made for exports. And part of why the industry collapses is that it becomes cheaper to produce it industrially elsewhere. So it moves kind of to the European islands, to Italy, to Spain, and then eventually to the Caribbean, where it becomes uh, essentially free because it's basically the origins of the transatlantic slave trade is in that sugar production.